Welcome back to the School of Muscle. Today, we have on Chris Barricat. And Chris has a master's in exercise science. He's got a bachelor's in athletic training. He's an adjunct professor at the University of Tampa. He's got his own coaching business and his own training programs and things like that. He's an educator. And the dude is pretty freaking jacked. And that never hurts. So today, we discuss exercise selection, how to program metabolite techniques, how to pick exercises. We discuss hot yoga and other things like that. We, we discuss a lot of things in this podcast. Chris did, did an amazing job and I really hope you enjoy it. So without further ado, Chris Barricat. So I think the first place that I'd like to start this conversation, Chris, and first off, thank you very much for coming on today. Oh, no, it's my pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. Cool. So the first place I'd kind of like to start is you had a fairly recent like Instagram post on some potential mistakes that you made kind of earlier on in your training. And one of those was maybe picking some exercises that didn't quite suit you as well. So would you kind of like to discuss kind of what what you figured out with picking exercises that might not suit you very well? Yeah, for sure, man. Um, there's a ton of different things we can talk about, but I'll use my personal experience and um, also try to give your listeners feedback on how they can apply this to themselves. So um, I think a lot of people fell into this, especially in the natural bodybuilding community, where um, a lot of the more popular people were starting to power build and uh, everyone was getting really caught up on the big three. Um, so for me personally, I was trying to get my, my back spot numbers up every week, going in there, ready to kill it. And the truth of the matter is, like, you know, I made a little bit of progress over time, but not nearly as much as I should have. And um, there's so many reasons for that. Some of it was issues with the programming. I was working at too high of an intensity or my total volume was too high, so I wasn't able to actually recover well. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, like, the barbell back squat just isn't the best exercise for me. Um Every single time I would go in there and crush those those heavy leg sessions, my legs would never get sore. But from a central nervous system fatigue standpoint, I was shot the next day, wanted to sleep for 10, 12 hours. Um, but yeah, my legs weren't actually getting sore. You know, my low back would get stiff. And I was deadlifting a lot at the same time. And um, I wasn't maximizing muscle hypertrophy because I was too caught up in a strength kind of focus mm -hmm. um, that just wasn't necessary for bodybuilding. I had no interest in ever competing in powerlifting. So the fact that I got caught up in the big three was just silly. Yeah. I, I think that's something that a lot of people struggle with is they kind of, they lose sight of what their actual goal is. Like I know for me personally, my, my goal really is just like physique oriented. And sometimes I'll do the same thing to where I think I'll have to go in there and pull a heavy single on deadlifts or something like that. So did you kind of come to that conclusion by just kind of thinking to yourself, Hey, everything is kind of fatigued here, except for the muscle I'm actually trying to tra train. Is that kind of how you came to that decision that probably not a good exercise for you? You know, you know what the biggest learning experience for me was, um, in my 2017 contest prep last year, um, my third day of prep, like official day of prep, I, I sprained my SI joint um, deadlifting. And that, so from that day, I said, okay, I'm not going to back squat and I'm not going to deadlift right now during prep until things get better. Um, long story short, I didn't do barbell back squats at all the entire 2017 contest prep. Um, I did throw deadlifts back in, but my legs literally made improvements. Um, and the coolest thing is I actually have, uh, ultrasound data, like muscle thickness mm -hmm. data on my quadriceps. And I retained all of my muscle tissue in my quadriceps, if not making some gains on like the rectus femoris or vastus lateralis in different, different regions. So it was really cool. I just, uh, basically swapped out barbell back squats with hack squats and I started killing hack squats. I got really, really good at them. Mm -hmm. And uh, for once, my legs were brutally sore. But from a from a central nervous standpoint, I wasn't nearly as fatigued. No, that's really cool. That that reminds me of something that 
you're probably aware of him, Dr. Mike Isertel. He'll he'll talk a lot about picking exercises that have a really high like stimulus to fatigue ratio to where you get a lot of muscle stimulus out of the exercise, but maybe not as much like central nervous system fatigue and stuff like that. And that sounds like you made a really good trade off there. And as for like people you coach and maybe even yourself personally, as you go through like a dieting phase, do you tend to stray away from like those, those bigger lifts a little bit and maybe go more towards those less like central taxing exercises? Or do you kind of just depends on the person or what do you kind of do there? It definitely depends on each person. Um, something that I've just kind of seen over the years, something that kind of sucks is the people that respond really well to training, um, they're going to basically respond to anything. And it seems like they can also tolerate these compound heavier lifts at higher intensities much better than their counterparts can. So, um, for some people, it literally doesn't matter. Just get them in the gym, have them execute an exercise with relatively good form and they're going to make progress. And then with other people, it's like, you need to make sure that they're recovering optimally, that they're getting the right muscle stimulation you're looking for and that they're able to progressively overload. So um, it definitely depends. But yeah, there's there's so many variables to take into account. Yeah, and I totally agree to where the people that, some of the most like popular people that a lot of people see are probably also the people that have pretty good genetics. And a lot of those people can usually, like you said, kind of a little bit get away a little bit more with combining a lot of strength and hypertrophy work. And have, have you kind of found it for yourself just focusing on one at a time works a little bit better? Or do you think uh, more of a power building thing still kind of works? Or what do you think there? Yeah. Um, so my, my my personal opinion, if, if you're bodybuilding and, and your primary goal is hypertrophy, um, I never... S- I really don't think there's any purpose to ever lift heavier than fives or sixes. You know, I would never do a triple or a single. Mm -hmm. Um, If your goal is is power is bodybuilding, excuse me. Um, But at the same time, it's important to make sure you're getting stronger at compounds. Just you need to pick and choose which compounds those are going to be. Um, So just as a quick example, right now I'm not barbell back squatting, but I am using uh, safety bar squats as one of my primary leg exercises. So um, obviously I want to continue to progressively overload that exercise, but it doesn't have to be this this barbell back squat that everyone likes to post on IG. Yeah, for sure. So your approach is more so, let's still have kind of a few more staple compound exercises that we're kind of tracking over time, but they're more so exercises that kind of work well with you that you feel like you have good technique and you feel like you actually train the target muscle group rather than like the big three or something like that for sure yeah like i'm I'm not barbell bench pressing at all in terms of flat barbell press right now and i haven't for a long time um i'm doing a dumbbell for flat and i'm doing incline for uh sorry barbell for incline presses um but yeah just people get so caught up in one specific exercise and they're really missing the point. They're definitely missing the point. Yeah, that for sure. And do you, do you think that the majority of the exercises should still be those kind of those, I'm waving my pencil around here and it's distracting me, but do you think that the majority of exercises should still probably be those kind of those compound barbell, dumbbell, those more systemically taxing exercises or do you like to have a nice mix of machine work and stuff there what's kind of your approach on that sort of things i personally uh enjoy a nice mix and i i think that works best for a lot of people and again there's going to be outliers on both sides of the spectrum so some people a might just be able to tolerate a whole lot of compound lifts and and taxing Mm. lifts more so than others and then on the, on the far side of the spectrum, um, those lifts might not fit people's frames well, and they might be better off using cable machines a bit more. Um, just to give you an idea, like right now, I, I definitely do these big compound lifts every training session, but uh, I feel like I'm doing like two big, two or three compounds, but they're they're different variations. It's not it's not what everyone just kind of automatically assumes, right? Right. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you kind of maybe almost limit it to maybe two or three big compounds per session because like there is only so many compound exercises that you can do in a single session. Like I know a lot of people, if if they squat in a session, that's basically all all they're good for in a session. So is that two or three exercises, those staples, kind of what you go with there? Yeah, and it depends. If you're using the term compound as the textbook term where it's just a multi-joint movement, mm-hmm. or are you looking at those those barbell compound lifts? Like it's different, right? So right. for example, a bent over barbell row or a bent over penlay row is much different than a hammer strength high row, but they're still compound movements. They're still multi-joint movements. So I, terminology is, is super right. important. Um, you know, a lat pull down is still a compound lift, but that's not necessarily what I'm talking about. If mm-hmm. that makes sense. Yep. That, that makes complete sense. Yeah. So kind of similar to exercise selection, are there like any particular exercises that you think that like a lot of people just tend to really struggle with? Like I know for me personally, barbell rows, I, I could not engage my back with barbell rows until I really started digging into the technique and practice it for a couple of years. So what, how do you think that comes into play with some exercises you just have to practice a lot before getting good at them? Or do you think there's exercises that I'm kind of asking like three different questions all in one here, but I'll just let you go with is, is there certain exercises that you think people really struggle with? Um, not necessarily in, in terms of there's a particular exercise that's hard, but to use your example of the, the bent over barbell row, um, no matter what the exercise is, I think people always need to take a step back and think about, okay, what muscles am I trying to train? What's the function of that muscle and what joints need to move for that muscle to contract properly? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so for example, if you're doing a barbell row, this is actually a, a great topic because there's so many ways you can perform the barbell row depending on what you're trying to, um, target right Mm -hmm. so just for example let's say you're taking a a relatively wide grip you're staying pronated um and your elbows are flaring out right so your shoulder joint your glenohumeral joint is going to be moving more so in a horizontal abduction plane rather than pure extension Mm -hmm. okay and your scapula are going to retract straight back instead of depress down if you're performing it that way so what is that going to target? That's going to target rear delt. That's going to target um, mid traps, rhomboids, teres major. So it's important to ask yourself, what muscles am I trying to train and, and what's their function? How am I actually supposed to execute this movement? So if you did a barbell row in that fashion where you initiate it with retraction, your elbows are flaring out wide, you're going to get a ton of upper back stimulation. Now, if you want to target the lats, you're going to have to depress your scapula down instead of necessarily retracting them. So you want to start by downwardly rotating and depressing them. Your elbows are going to be tucked by your side. So now you're moving through pure extension instead of horizontal abduction. Mm-hmm. So, it's, you know, it's called the barbell, the barbell row, but there's 10 different ways to perform it, right? Yep. Uh, so I think it's just really important that people take a step back and think, okay, what am I trying to target? How do I have to execute this exercise to actually target that tissue? Yeah, I, I think that's a great example. And there's, I feel like that can be said for a lot of compound exercises, like for lunges. You can do a lunge in a way to really tax your glutes, but you can also set up a lunge in a really good way to tax your quads. And there's just so many different ways to do it and really asking yourself, okay, what's my goal with this ex- exercise? What muscle group am I trying to stimulate? And what's the best way I can do that? I think that's a really great approach there. For sure, for sure. And, you know, uh, even taking the, the barbell bench press, you know, a lot of people, oh, should my elbows be wide? Should they be tucked in? You know, a lot of it's going to come down to your, your frame and what's most comfortable for you. But at the same time, like, are you trying to maximize muscle activation in one particular muscle or are you trying to move as much load as you possibly can? And that's going to also dictate how you're performing the movement. So um, it's super important that people have a goal for each exercise before performing the exercise, right? right? So what's, what's their thought process and the reasoning of why they're doing it? Yep. I, 
I think that's really good. And, you know, some people get caught up thinking like there's like, like you said before, there's, there's not really like special exercises, like exercises are tools to stimulate the muscle group you're trying to target. So by taking a step back, thinking about, okay, what muscle group am I trying to target? All right, let's use this exercise as a tool to stimulate that muscle group. I think that's really good there. For sure. For sure. Um, there's so many things we can talk about in regards to exercise selection. If you kind of want to continue down that stream, um, I could talk about some of my thought processes in regards to, uh, programming for that. Yeah, for sure. Go for it. Okay. So for those of you that uh, may not be familiar with a lot of the training programs that, uh, I basically, I sell with my business partner, Chris Elkins, it's called the max hype training programs. Um, and a lot of the, the way that the exercises are ordered um, are similar across the board for a specific reason. So we like use, utilizing exercises that overload and train a muscle in its fully shortened position first, early on in the workout, then work through the mid-range. And then at the end of the workout, we perform exercises that overload the muscle in its lengthened and stretched position. Um, so I'll provide a few examples just so yeah. you get an idea of this. Um, let's take the biceps, for example. Um, if you're doing spider curls where your, your, your chest is on an incline bench, your shoulders flex to 90 degrees and you're performing elbow flexion here, you're getting your bicep in a relatively short position because the secondary function of the bicep is to flex the shoulder joint. And obviously the primary function is to flex the elbow. So right here, the bicep is very, very shortened. Then if you're performing an incline dumbbell curl where your shoulder is extended, the long head of the bicep is now lengthened and you're performing elbow flexion in this plane. So you're providing a different stimulus and you're training each muscle through its full range of motion, which is important. Um, but I think a lot of people can make mistakes or kind of uh, shoot themselves in the foot a little bit if they're performing exercises that overload that stretch position first. Okay, um, so we can even use the hamstrings as a, as a really good example because I see a lot of people do this. If you're performing lying hamstring curls, you can extend at your hip, you can contract your glutes, and then you can flex the knee to get your hamstring as short as possible. Okay, um, a lot of people. So the, the difference between the lying hamstring curl and the seated hamstring curl is the position of your hips. Right, seated, mm -hmm. your hips are in a flex position lying, your hips are in an extended position. And that gives you the opportunity to really overload that shortened position for the hamstrings where the hips extended and the knee is flexed at the same time. Now, an exercise that a lot of people love to train the hamstrings are RDLs, mm -hmm. right? Remaining deadlifts. What that does, that's obviously an eccentric dominant exercise. You're overloading the hamstrings in their length and stretch position. And as you know, Heavy eccentrics create a lot of muscle damage. So if you were to do that, let's say first, you're going to significantly mm. decrease your ability to perform hamstring curls at, at a high level later on in the session. So I highly recommend that you perform those exercises that shorten the muscle first and then lengthen the muscle later on. Cool. So that, and the main reason for that is to kind of prevent like, muscle damage earlier on in the session to kind of save that a little bit? Is that kind of the main reason for that? To essentially save it. You know, obviously we're weight training and one of our goals is to create some sort of extent of muscle damage. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just know that, and I've seen this in training, if you start with that first, your ability to produce force with that muscle later on is going to be taxed, right? Um, I've seen people recently exercise one of their of their training session is heavy heavy dumbbell pullovers mm. and i'm i'm just yeah. like why are you doing that first right because they're overloading that lengthened position they're creating a ton of damage which is great and i understand that if they do it first they're going to be able to do more weight on that particular exercise but right. my point is that's going to decrease their ability to perform their pull downs properly or with a sufficient load or their barbell rows or you know their other compound lifts they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot where i'd rather do my compounds heavy to start mm. and then do some of that isolation work that's going to create more muscle damage later on so it's definitely something to take into consideration um 
And just to kind of keep rolling with this, talk about different muscles. You know, if you're performing like a pec deck fly, like a machine fly, Mm -hmm. the great thing about that is that the tension is equal throughout the entire range of motion, right? So you can overload the pecs in that fully shortened position where you're horizontally adducted um, and just get a really good contraction, right? Like if, if people have a hard time feeling their pecs, that's a great exercise to do it because you're overloading that muscle in its shortened position. Now, if you take a dumbbell fly where you're really only overloading it in the lengthened position, right. um, you definitely don't want to do that first per se, mm. but it's still a great exercise to include in your program if you want to create a lot of muscle damage. Um, it's just something to take into consideration. It's like, okay, when am I going to apply that? Right. I that, yeah. that That's honestly something that I, I've never even really considered is kind of saving those like high high stretch movements towards later in your program so you don't necessarily affect your performance as much on those other exercises where you train it in a shortened position. That's that's really interesting. That's cool there. Cool, man. I'm, I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> yes. Definitely check, check out Max Hype. I'll send it to you uh, once we get off the air. Is And is that, can people find that at competitivebreed.com? Is oh. that where they can find that or? Um, we have a tab on competitive read, but just go to maxhypetraining.com. Okay, so there's and, there's uh, two separate places for that then. Yeah, yeah. Max okay. Hype Training is your best spot to go for it. Cool, cool. That that's really cool. And is there any any anything else like that would that you consider when you choose your choosing your exercises or even in your exercise order throughout a session, or is that kind of the the main thing there? Um, that's that's the main thing, but at the same time, you know taking the old school priority principle into play, that's still super important, right? So um, just for example, like if, if you know your upper chest is lagging um, and you have a you have pretty decent pecs, but you're still lacking meat on that clavicular head, you know, definitely program your incline press before your flat press. But mm-hmm. a lot of people already discuss stuff like that. It's nothing, yeah. nothing novel. For sure, that's cool. And what, yeah. what do you kind of like to do with training to failure? Do you generally save that till later in the session or what's kind of your approach with training to failure there? Oh man, I would love to talk about, um, RPE and RIR and, uh, and failure training just a tad because I, I feel like there's so many viewpoints that are shared and perspectives that are shared, just like I'm about to share my perspective. And then there's there's viewers and listeners right now that might take what I say and just like run with it or they're going to take what someone else says and runs with it and I feel like it, it creates more bad than good because mm-hmm. there's so there's so much out there there's so many different perspectives but um one thing I think that's important for people to understand is that if you're trying to grow you need to create you need to have a stimulus that forces adaptations to occur okay so the more advanced that you are, those adapt like the signal that you're that you're required to provide usually is going to be more intense than it was, you know, when you first started training. Like everybody knows that when when you're when you're a newbie, you're going to make gains basically regardless of what you do. Um, but without going off too long into a tangent, the reason I'm talking about this is because I know a lot of people started training at you know an RPE of eight. RP of seven and they, they said, Oh no, I I never want to go to failure because I'm not going to be able to recover. And a lot of those people, I feel like they don't make a lot of progress in their physique. Um, even if they're able to progressively overload, like slowly, but surely like their progress is so, so small. Um, and a, a huge problem with RPE in my honest opinion for most people is that they don't really know what a true RPE 10 is, okay? So there's a phenomenon that I'm sure everyone listening has experienced. You're performing a weight, let's call it flat barbell bench press, you have X amount of pounds on there. You're doing it alone, and you might only get five reps, right? Then you ask someone to come spot you. They don't touch the bar at all, and you get like seven or eight right? All you the perform time. more reps just because someone is there behind you. You don't have a fear in your head that you're going to fail and, and so on and so forth. Um, or, you know, you're doing more weight and that person who's spotting you isn't helping you at all. 
but they're providing that external stimulus. They're like screaming at you or motivating you in some sort of way. Mm -hmm. And you have a much better set. Um, the reason I mention that is because I just feel like so many people were calling their RPE eights and nines, but it was truly like a five or a six. So it's like, now you're training so far away from that intensity point that you should be, that you're just, you're really, really missing, um, what you're looking for. Like you're in the gym to grow, to make adaptations. And, uh, I think a lot of people got too far away from it. Um, so long story short, should you train to failure every set? Absolutely not. Um, should you should you go to the gym and at least have one set per training session where you gave it everything you possibly had? I hope so. I mean, it's not fun if you're not, right? Right. Yeah. That's at least take one set in your entire training session to failure. Like, please, at least do one set to failure. Yep. That, that is very similar to kind of how I view it. Like, I feel like, man, a lot of people that really get caught up in trying to hit their perfect reps and reserve or their RPE on every single set are also the people that would probably benefit from just, just taking a set almost as, as hard as they can go with it, you know? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And then it comes into, we could kind of tie this back into exercise selection mm. and connect all the dots. So if, I did a true RPE 10 on a set of squats, you know, in the eight to 10 rep range, that's going to beat the crap out of me. But if I did a true RPE 10 on leg extensions, that's not nearly as, you know, centrally fatiguing. So yeah. you can pick and choose where you're going to actually go to failure and see how you recover and see how you respond and then adjust your program. Um, I think a lot of people want a blueprint given to them. They want to say, okay, here's my training program. I'm going to RPE 8 on this exercise, RPE 7 on that exercise, and RPE 10 on this exercise, whatever it may be. They want something in front of them that they can run with. But I think it's really important that you auto-regulate, you see what's working for you, you see how you're recovering, and you make adjustments along the way. Yeah, I I think that makes a lot of sense. And kind of in general, do you usually save failure for those more isolation type exercises or will you still take sets of some of your compound lifts? I'm, I'm sure it depends on the exercise and the individual and things like that. But in general, do you have any recommendations that you usually do there? Yeah. Um, like you said, it, it really does depend on so many factors, but um, I'll use what I personally do and what I kind of suggest a lot of my clients try and then we adjust as, as we need to. Um, but on those compound lifts right now, what I've been doing is I like to do warm up sets that are very far from failure. I'm just building up load to kind of get my body used to heavier loads and provide that stimulus. And then I like to take like one top set. Um, on those compound lifts, I would call it like an RPE, like 8.5. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not always crushing it uh, on those compound lifts. And then it, let's say I hit like an RPE nine, I might back off. If I'm at an, at an RPE 8.5, I might stay with that same weight and then just repeat the set. Um, it really depends, but I like to do a top set on my compound lifts and then maybe a few back off sets. Um, and it also depends on like how I'm warming up. So sometimes I'm warming up and instead of doing like two to five reps on a warm up set, I might just kind of treat it as a working set. So I'll, I'll hit like a, a higher rep goal and I'll say, okay, this, that was a working set because I exerted myself to let's call it RPA. Mm -hmm. And then I, I take a heavier set after that. But yeah, there's a thousand ways to approach it, man. Um, definitely don't be scared to, to go to failure uh, every here and there. Pick and choose the exercises and uh, see how you respond. I think if you have a lagging body part, first and foremost, you want to make sure you're actually executing the exercise properly. Okay, Because most people that have bad body parts, the form on those movements usually suck. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, and if their form is good, then they're usually lacking intensity. So if your form is great and you're not responding at all, you're not getting sore, you're not feeling anything, um, probably need to ramp up that intensity. And that's a place where, hey, go to failure if you haven't been. 
you know, like really push it and see what happens. Yeah. And would you kind of look, so I love how you prioritize. Let's first look at technique and make sure that that's there. And then after you do that, your kind of first place is looking at relative intensity and say, say the relative intensity is there. Would you then kind of look at maybe increasing the amount of sets or their volume? Or what would you kind of look at after that for a, a weaker body part? Yeah. So a, f- a few good questions there. So if their form truly is perfect and their relative intensity is where it needs to be, um, I would, I, if we're doing hypertrophy specific training, I will ask them, are you getting sore? Okay. If they're not getting sore, um, ever, like at all, Mm -hmm. then we definitely throw in, um, more sets closer to failure, or we might throw in some more advanced techniques, um, maybe some supersets, maybe some intraset stretching, something different, something novel and see if they get sore. Um, but yeah, it just, it depends on so many factors. Yeah. And that kind of brings up another question is supersets and metabolite techniques and intraset stretching and stuff like that. How, how much does that kind of play a role in your programming and how do you kind of go about programming some of that stuff in? Yeah. Um, a few things we can talk about for sure. Um, in regards to supersets, I think it's important to, uh, see how it's set up, right? So if you're supersetting, uh, you know, biceps and triceps, like an agonist antagonist superset, um, you're not necessarily creating more metabolic stress in that muscle tissue, right? You're just, you're basically performing the same amount of work in a shorter period of time. So it's just becoming more efficient. Um, whereas if you're doing, uh, let's just call it, you know, pec deck flies supersetted with pushups, body weight pushups to failure, we are doing a chest exercise and another chest exercise, then you're really going to be ramping up more metabolic stress, more lactic acid and stuff like that. Um, I, I think they both have their place. So if you spend a lot of time in the beginning of your workouts with more intense compound lifts, then you can start supersetting at the end of your workout just to make your total training session a bit shorter Mm -hmm. and increase your efficiency. Um, And uh, my honest opinion, hey, I think it's fun, so that never hurts, right? Um, But then if you're doing something where you're trying to create more metabolic stress or you're doing the same muscle group back-to-back, it becomes just important to realize, okay, how am I recovering from that stimulus? Is it too much for me or is it something I'm able to handle? Right. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And as with everything in like your training program, you always got to try to pay attention to how you're responding, how you're recovering and adjust from there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, something like intraset stretching is, is interesting. There really isn't much research at all. Um, there was a study that came out this year in 2018 from Brazil um, that it was performed on the on the gas rock on the calves, and they saw some some positive signs from intraset stretching. Um, but more research is needed, and we actually might be doing a study on that in 2019 at the university I teach at. So that would be really cool. Um, that might be in the works. Another thing I wanted to mention is uh, blood flow restriction training, mm-hmm. and how you can kind of utilize that as a tool to increase uh, total training frequency. Um, without necessarily increasing your recovery demands. So something that we do in um, one of our max type training programs, we have a full leg day, we have a, a quad focused leg day, and we have a hamstring, a glute and hamstring focused leg day on that training split. And uh, on our quad focused leg day, we finish off the workout with blood flow restriction hamstring curls and walking lunges. Okay. So the reason we do that is to provide a growth stimulus to the hamstrings without creating muscle damage and without increasing recovery demands on the hamstring tissue itself. So um, that's just a a nice way to increase your training frequency without actually increasing your recovery demands. So you're still getting that growth signal. You're still increasing muscle protein synthesis in that tissue but you're not going to be sore the next day and it's not going to impair your training when you're hitting it, you know, whether it's 48 hours later or whatever it may be. Um, so same thing in that program when we have our glute and ham shrink focus day 
At the very end of it, we do BFR leg extensions and BFR walking lunges mm. to get a lot of blood into the quads, stimulate some sort of growth, but not actually create muscle damage. Right. So BFR is pretty BFR is pretty cool if you use it if you use it sparingly, if you use it correctly, and and you have, you know, logical reasoning behind why you're throwing it in there. Right. So you kind of use it more so as a tool to, hey, let's see if we can get a little bit of a stimulus here without necessarily causing too many demands for recovery and muscle damage and things like that then. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I actually think um, from what I've seen is that when you're doing BFR training, it can increase your recovery from your last training session. So mm. let's say you hit legs you know, 48 hours before. Um, if you did BFR, you probably – you're going to get a ton of blood in there. And, and we know there's so many positives to that to right. improve recovery. Um, but what what typically happens is the next day you're way less sore. If not, you feel like you're fully recovered. Mm. So it's something to play around with if if you haven't. And um, definitely if you're more advanced where you need uh, higher frequencies. Otherwise, it's you know a tool that you don't necessarily need to mess around with. Cool. Well, that sounds really cool. And I think we've put a pretty good dent in exercise selection and programming and all that stuff right now. And something that you mentioned before the show was doing some, some hot yoga and stuff like that and thinking (laughs) that there's, you know, some potential benefits to that. So would you kind of like to discuss on why you do that and what potential benefits you might think that that may have? Yeah. So I'll give the listeners a quick backstory. Uh, right before I came on, didn't have these headphones on me. So I had to sprint to my car, grab my headphones and I told him, I was like, wow, that was the most cardio I've done in a while. So then he asked me, you know, am I doing any cardio in the off season? And am, am I in a gaining phase? And I said, no, you know, I'm not doing cardio, but I do hot yoga once a week. And I, I do my best to try to stay on top of that. Um, it's pretty crazy. I've actually, I've done yoga for 10 years total. Obviously it was extreme. It was really sporadic in the beginning, but it's something I always enjoyed. I always felt good while I was doing it and afterwards. Um, and then in my last contest prep, I stopped doing fasted cardio where I would just walk around Mm -hmm. and I started doing fasted yoga. And, uh, it was just so beneficial because rather than just burning calories, I was getting that mental and emotional time to just clear my mind, um, while increasing my physical recovery capabilities. And I just felt freaking good. So (laughs) Um, I kept doing it, and I, I do think it's something that people, if you've never tried yoga, you should attempt that practice once. See how you feel. Um, I think you're going to get physical benefits as well as mental, emotional benefits. That's something a lot of people don't don't discuss or they overlook, um, but it's absolutely massive into how you feel. Yeah, I think I think with when thinking about increasing on, on the activity level side of it, I think when thinking about increasing your activity, it doesn't have to necessarily just be doing more steps or going on walks and things like that. It can be these other more enjoyable things that you like doing. Like it can be hot yoga. It can be, you know, it could be cleaning your car. You could be knocking two birds out with one stone. Like it doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily have to be just, just straight walking, you know? And I think yeah. that and I think that like the the mental benefits of the relaxation that that could have, especially in a dieting phase, could also be really beneficial as well. For sure, for sure. Um, there's so many things I like about it. So when it when it comes to just increasing your calorie expenditure, so many people are getting really really caught up in tracking how many steps they're doing per day. Um, or if you're prescribing cardio, you typically say burn X amount of calories or work at this intensity for this amount of minutes. Mm -hmm. So as an athlete or as the person going through it, you're still performing this task saying like, okay, I need to reach X amount of steps or X amount of minutes or X amount of calories burned. It's another mental stress, right? Right. No matter how you want to look at it. Like even if you enjoy it, it's still something that you need to tick off. Like, okay, okay, this mm-hmm. is on the. This is on my to do list. I need to take it off, and I'm not saying that if if you, you know, replace that with something else that you're not taking off another box, but it can be something that you're not necessarily thinking about as much, and it's providing you with so much more than just burning calories or burning a little bit more fat. 
Um, and then in, in regards to yoga specifically, obviously you're stretching your tissues. Um, hot yoga is obviously hot. So you're sweating, you're getting blood into the tissue. I think it's improving recovery in that sense. You're improving your flexibility and mobility. Um, you're getting more in tune with your body. And as a bodybuilder, I mean, that's obviously mm-hmm. extremely important, um, especially if you're a competitor and you need to learn how to pose and contract every muscle really well under your own control. Um, that's cool. And then something that people don't necessarily realize is that depending on the, the yoga you're doing, um, there's phases of it where it's kind of like interval training. So some poses are extremely difficult. Um, and what you do is you do the pose, you hold it for X amount of seconds, depending on what class you're taking and how the instructor goes about it. And then you rest. So for example, like, uh, I did a pose today, it's called locust pose. Right when I was done with it and I was, I was resting, you feel your heart racing, right? So you know that you're doing some sort of interval. Um, and we obviously know that interval training can also help with fat oxidation. So there's, there's just so many ways to approach it, man, and uh, it's something I really enjoy. So, yeah, give it a shot. Yeah, that, that's cool. I, you know, I've, I've never done it. I know I would go in there, look like an idiot. But, hey, sometimes you got to just knock down that barrier and see how you like something, you know? Nothing good happens in your comfort zone, man. For sure. And yeah. that, that kind of brings me to, kind of brings me to my last question. And that is, what are some things that you've kind of struggled with, with breaking down those barriers of building your business? And is there anything that comes to mind that were maybe mental hurdles or things that were just difficult for you to kind of get things rolling at all for you? Very cool question. Um, probably the wrong person to ask for a lot of reasons, and I'll explain. Um, everything that's that's happened in regards to the coaching, my career as a coach, my profession, what I do full time, it all happened very organically. It wasn't the initial plan. So um, when I was an undergrad, I, I studied athletic training, and my goal was to get my athletic training degree so I can move on to physical therapy and work as a physical therapist. Um, during that time, I was competitively bodybuilding. I fell in love with it, and I came across a exercise nutrition grad program, shifted gears, and went that way. But long story short, my coaching business has grown in a very organic fashion, and I've never done anything with the intent of, all right, mm-hmm. let's, let me make this business move. Yeah. Right. This is, I, I want to attract more clients. So let me do this business thing here. Let me make this business move here. So I am the worst businessman, <laughs> but fortunately business is very, very good. That's so good. it's, it's not, um, I've never really had that strategic business mindset. I just love coaching. Mm-hmm. If you do good work, that is going to spread. Um, if you care about the people you work with, they're going to sense that and realize that and appreciate it. They're going to tell their friends, their families, they're going to talk about you on their social platforms and, and things will grow. Um, the work will speak for itself. I think it's really important to be patient. Um, I just made a post on, on this the other day, my first like season coaching, I had, uh, two athletes compete in an entire season. And then the following year, it might've been like five athletes and the following year, it might've been like eight to 10. And this past year I had, uh, I think like 19 athletes step on stage and I've worked with like over 25 competitors throughout this year. Um, so things will grow over time. And I still work with gen pop and, and athletes. It's basically a 50, 50 split, mm. but, um, just do good work and it'll come back to you. I, I keep things pretty simple. Yeah. So basically, you know, I feel like a lot of coaches nowadays, that's kind of how it happened. It kind of ha- happened out of just pure, they love doing it. Some people asked them how they're doing it. They were really good at helping those people. Those people told other people and then things just kind of snowballed from there. A thousand percent. Uh, I, yeah, when I started too, I was coaching people for free. So mm-hmm. you do it because you love it. And it, it's still something I would do. Like if I had another side business or whatever it is, another career that was keeping me financially secure, whatever you want to call it, I would still coach people because I love it. So um, if you're in it for the right reasons, you're going to do well. 
your athletes or your athletes or clients, depending on what realm you're getting into, they're going to get good results. And then that's going to just snowball. So I keep it pretty simple, man. Yeah, th- that's awesome. I think a really good sign that you're doing something that you really enjoy that you should be doing is would you ask yourself, okay, if money wasn't an option, would I still enjoy doing this thing? And totally sounds like that aligns well for you there. Yeah, for sure, man. For sure. Cool. So I think that's about all the time we got today. Where, where can people find your stuff, find more about you? For sure, man. Um, so in regards to social media, my most uh, active platform is Instagram. So it's just at Christopher.Barakat. That's B-A-R-A-K-A-T. Um, and then my website for coaching is competitivebreed.com. So that's my specific, um, that's my own brand essentially. And then for my training programs that I sell with my business partner, that's maxhypetraining.com. Awesome. Well, that, that sounds good. I recommend everybody going and checking that out. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Got it, man. It was a pleasure. I'm glad your finals are over and I hope you crush them. You would be both, man. (laughs) Good luck to you, man. Good luck with the rest of your studies. Yep. Thank you. You got it, dude. Take care. Thank you so much for checking out the podcast today. I really do appreciate it. Make sure to go check out Chris's stuff. Go check out my stuff at ryanjsolomon.com. Screenshot it, put it on your story, and I will see you in that next one.